Hello, everybody, dear participants. It's our pleasure to welcome you to the second Meet the Expert live session of our online course of the Asterusia Hybrid University. This course is combining asynchronous self-paced sessions, as you very well know, with the synchronous learning sessions like uh, the today's webinar. I am Vicky. I'm working in the educational projects of MIO, and I will be facilitating this webinar together with my colleagues, Iro and Olga. We will start immediately with some housekeeping notes. First of all, interpretation. This meeting as well has simultaneous interpretation in both uh, English and French. So if you prefer to follow the webinar in French language, all you have to do is to use the interpretation uh, button at the bottom of your screen and you switch the channel. We kindly remind you that uh, this webinar is going to be recorded for educational purposes and for all those who cannot attend today. So feel free if you want to turn off your camera. In any case, if you don't have a very quick uh, internet connection, we recommend you to switch off your camera. About the background noise, all participants have been muted upon their entrance to the session. You are kindly also asked to keep your micros off during the meeting. Uh, that's all about the housekeeping notes now. We really want to, let, to get to know you better, so we are kindly asking you to type on the chat your country and your city. Let's see. You have one minute to write your country and city in the chat. All right, we can see Greece, Italy, Bulgaria, Croatia, Mexico is here, Nigeria, South Africa, Tunisia, Egypt, Italy, Italy again. Mm -hmm. Lebanon, Alexandria from Egypt this time, Romania, welcome all. Okay, now we are asking you to continue writing the chat, this time expressing your mood, just one word, expressing your mood right now. How are you feeling? What is your mood? Let us know. Curious, excited, happy, content, satisfied already, <laughs> a bit tired, exhausted, interested, graceful, and happy, stressed. Grateful. All right. And ambitious. Thank you all for that. Before starting our question and answer session about week two, we think that it is important and interesting to have an idea of what was your reflection during the first week. So, uh, Iro, please let us know what were the key messages from the participants uh, during their evaluation and their feedback session about the first week of our course. Iro, the floor is yours. Hello, welcome everyone. Also from uh, my side, um, I am Miro, and I would like to um, uh, make some uh, reflections regarding the evaluation many of you have done in uh, week one. Uh, thank you, first of all, for your contribution and your comments. Uh, as we said also in the first session, it's a mutually learning exercise, so we learn from, from your advice. Um, there have been some comments regarding the sound um, in some videos. Um, at this point, it is difficult for us to subtitle them in English. However, as the videos will remain uh, public after the course is uh, over in YouTube channel, uh, we will uh, try to incorporate the English uh, subtitles and um, so that uh, you can use them in the future. 
Um, there was another comment on uh, some overlap, uh, overlapping uh, of the themes and speakers. Uh, we understand to a certain extent we try to, to avoid that but uh, uh, of course we have um, some lecturers whose uh, expertise overlaps so um, yeah we have some overlapping we hope that we do not have gap uh, in uh, the learning content um, some of you asked for more examples from uh, more regions. Uh, it is true that in week one, we did not have so many examples, but as you can see in the second week, we start to um, elaborate more on uh, examples and certain um, success and failures. So we will keep growing that in the third week as well. Um, some of you, and I agree with you, asked for more interaction from learners. Um, as is, this is the first, time that uh, we try this course we didn't know exactly what to expect how many participants we would have uh, we could only estimate or guess um, so we have in mind some ideas for a, a possible future uh, session to make it even more interactive and uh, we will try even in week three to to make it a bit more interactive for you so you will uh, wait until uh, monday to see the learning content for week uh, three uh, one more comment regarding downloading the videos. All the videos are um, uploaded in the YouTube channel. The YouTube does not allow uh, downloading, but they're, they're free, they're public, so you can use them as long as you have the um, internet access. Um, so uh, last but not least, we are in an Ask the Expert, uh, Ask, Ask the Expert session. Uh, so we are uh, responding to certain uh, questions made by you to the experts of uh, week two uh, in the Slido. Uh, we can copy again in the Slido, now in the chat, the, the link so that you have a, a direct uh, connection to the list. Um, and I think we can uh, introduce at this point our experts for this week. Uh, starting from, should I do okay. it? I just copied the Slido's uh, <laughs> URL and the code for uh, the Q&A session, uh, yes. Uh, so the second week um, experts are Dr. Vasiliki Blami, an educator and an environmental researcher who has been involved in ecotourism and protected area conservation, both in Greece and abroad. Mr. Colin Campbell, based in Scotland, since 2011, Colin has been focusing on assist social capital as a resource for development for those interested in putting this into practice. Mr. Filippo Lanzarini from Italy, an expert in planning and management of parks and designated areas. He specializes on issues like uh, the territorial marketing and sustainable tourism, and he's closely following the UNESCO MAP program addressing candidacy dossiers especially. Mr. Vasilis Psaldas is a natural scientist and consultant for environmental education and education for sustainable development. He volunteers his many years in the Mediterranean Information Office and the MEDIS Network on activities and projects about water, marine, land, and biodiversity. He has been instrumental in the organization of the past uh, uh, summer universities. Uh, Professor Skoulos, uh, you know him very well. He's a scientific uh, a coordinator and supervisor of this and the previous uh, summer universities. Uh, we have today again uh, Mr. Jonathan Baker, uh, Regional Science Advisor and Head of the Science Unit at the UNESCO Regional Bureau for uh, Science and Culture in Europe, based in Venice. And we're also very pleased to have with us today uh, young experts and practitioners to present and uh, share with us uh, innovative uh, best practices from their countries and sites. Ms. Katrina Tomova, an environmental scientist from the Bulgarian Biodiversity Foundation. She has been working on existing and new BRs in her country, uh, such as the Central Balkan Biosphere Reserve that hosted uh, our uh, last uh, uh, live uh, summer university uh, in 2019. Mr. Chokri Mansur from Tunisia, environmental activist, research scientist and ecotour guide and yoga coach. And Ms. Jimena Montane, 
an environmental professional with experience in sustainable tourism, experiential education and rural development. She has been working with NGOs, governments and international organizations and Jimena is part of the team of the Market Ready Model. So uh, these are our guest trainers. Uh, we are also pleased to have with us in our second uh, live meeting, uh, Mr. Novrejo, the head of the management team of the Asterusia uh, Biosphere BR. Uh, Ms. Vrejo, uh, welcome today with us. Um, and I think that uh, Iro now has something to share with you, uh, a mini poll, Iro if I'm not wrong. Uh, yes, hello. I know everyone is uh, super excited and uh, ready to move on to the questions, but uh, um, in order to see a little bit your profile, um, maybe we can um, ask you one question about your relation to uh, biosphere reserve or protected area or another designated uh, site. So we have uh, several options and uh, you can choose what describes you best. Um, you feel uh, that uh, you are a, a manager, a scientist or field expert, a farmer or local producer, maybe a local entrepreneur, a teacher, young scientist, young activist, sorry, or citizen, you come from a local group or association, or you do not relate to any biosphere reserve or other designated area. I see so 45 people have already voted. Maybe we can wait a few more seconds so that we give the chance to everyone to vote. 50 people. It's a bit They may have a, uh, a yes. double or they, yeah. they could they could <laughs> be both, but uh, we wanted in this exercise to to in order to get a, a, a clearer idea to give them one option. So we see most people. Uh, I think you can see the results now. Can you see them? Tavlepete, Olga, tavlepete, the result. Ne. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Vasilis. Um, so we have uh, scientists together with us, young activists, teachers, and uh, most of you, one way or the other, um, uh, are related to a BR. One more quick poll regarding your progress in the second week of the e course. So how is your progress going? Have you completed week one and uh, now are progressing in week two already? Uh, you have completed al already the content of uh, the second week. Maybe you're behind, you have only seen bits and pieces or you're an outsider, you have never logged in the course. 41 votes so far. We wait a few more seconds. I think I can end. We have 50 votes, 49 votes. And uh, most of you have already completed the first week and are now in progress uh, of the second week. We have seen that uh, also through your uh, questions. We have seen also in this week, uh, um, some interesting uh, questions and uh, we are, uh, cannot wait to ask the experts to start replying to them and uh, without further ado maybe we can um, start with Professor Skoulos who I know has been studying uh, the plethora of uh, questions that were addressed to him and he will try to give an overall uh, synthesis to the main thank you. points asking the Th question. Thank you, thank you, Rob. Yes, indeed, uh, I try to combine uh, the, the questions and I start um, 
with the most provocative ones, the most difficult, challenging ones, um, the ones coming from uh, uh, Jan uh, Arteaga, um, what uh, should be done if the local community didn't agree with the proposed management plan. Uh, the second one, how can we integrate the uh, vision of locals with the vision, with the policies of government um, for a sustainable, about sustainable development from uh, Manal Fauzi. And uh, this, uh, to a certain extent, the answer to that uh, is, was from the preparation uh, what I presented in the preparation of the management plan. We, um, we don't move if the local community is against. So the question here, the question of um, uh, Jan um, should be clarified. Uh, are we talking about a local community that uh, has agreed to be their area to be a, a biosphere reserve and then they don't agree on the management plan or they don't agree that their area is a, a BR. Um, I guess you may have both, but in both cases, it shows that the, there was not enough preparation in order to bring these people together with you. And this is uh, what uh, I have to answer also to Manal. There is no uh, point to have a local vision and a government vision. We are talking about a joint shared vision of the people dealing with the management area, with the um, biosphere area. Uh, people who live there or people around or and all those in government agencies and departments that have to deal with this area. So this is why in the establishment part, the very first thing we do is we have a preliminary vision. We start discussing it and we bring the, the people uh, together if needed several times in order to formulate a shared vision. And here I have to touch upon also to what um, uh, Anastasia Mirli asked about um, how difficult it is uh, to explain to, to the local people the biosphere reserve. It is difficult. I don't think that is so difficult if there is no misunderstanding about what a biosphere reserve is. The main misunderstanding where many people are against is when they are afraid that you bring in many more rules, many more restrictions and other things, which is actually something that comes with the idea of a protected area. And uh, what we from the beginning explain is that yes, in the biosphere reserve, we have protection of the, of the biosphere, but this does not add. This is why we integrate in a biosphere reserve protected areas, perhaps as part of the core area. And this, exactly this is the way out you explain that the biosphere reserve is a combination and reconciliation between the protection and the protection conservation with sustainable development, not whatever development. So from the beginning, you have to build the common vision about what we want. We don't move for the establishment of a BR without having a consensus about having this. From the moment we have it, the management plan is an integral part of the designation. 
we submit at least the main lines of the management plan to the Secretariat of MAB. And this is actually one of the key components for the decision. So I, I hope that this is clear. We don't move without the local agreement. And this is the result of a preparation. And the, we have a step which is called later on the vision, the building, the setting up the vision. And this vision is very important because in this vision we'll say to what extent we want the conservation to be the predominant or the sustain or and sustainable development to be there and even which direction of sustainable development. We want ecotourism, we want agricultural quality products, we want uh, uh, other kind of development. This is part and parcel of the designation. So I come now to the second uh, uh, set of questions um, that was uh, asked by uh, Agnello Aloya, who said, okay, um, we have multiple designations in several areas. Do we have one plan or many plans? And uh, also uh, the, the question uh, of um, Ala Eldin Mahmoud, who say, please explain a little bit more about the decentralized management. Here I, I can explain with an example. We want to have as many as, not as many, as necessary, as many as necessary, other areas designated under different schemes. Each one of them has uh, um, its own philosophy, compatible in most cases, and their own way of reporting progress and uh, criteria. We need, we are inclusive and whole embracing. That means that we have the, in most cases in Europe, we have Natura 2000 sites. Natura 2000 has a certain background behind uh, criteria and other things. We have to follow them. So in this way, we say, okay, these areas, we check with them, is what they have enough for the protection. In most cases, in 99.9%, .9 they do. So they allow them to do their job. This is decentralized management. This, however, is not incompatible with what we are doing. We know that this particular system and authorities will be part of our governance. We have them in the governance scheme and they are responsible to deliver a good protection of these areas. This is decentralized management. The same way when we have even a UNESCO other site, a, a geopark or whatever, they have their own priorities. The, we allow them, or not only we allow, we encourage them to do their job. And we, as a biosphere reserve, have them in the governance body. And all together, in our plan, in our management plan, we have chapter A, biodiversity protection. Chapter two, development of products. Chapter three, whatever. So this brings together in a coherent plan the entire activity of the area. However, we allow each one of the competent authorities within this area to do their job. And this has to be compatible, of course, with the overall management. I hope that you uh, understand what I'm saying. Now, it was a very interesting uh, question about um, uh, how 
um, if uh, how, uh, how what is about several questions about uh, by uh, Maria uh, Kulic uh, is it necessary to revise the plan after some years within the 10 years um, by Ivana uh, Adzic um, is there any uh, prescribed procedure for updating the management plans um, by uh, Jan again uh, Arteaga how often should the BR um, action plan be updated um, the answer is whenever it's needed uh, we don't need to change management plan frequently uh, we need to make it known so because we need to make it known we should not change it frequently but we change it whenever we see that there are some bottlenecks some uh, something that we didn't um, think about uh, there are some emerging difficulties and here is where I said we need the adaptive management. We don't change the entire management plan. We change something which is ne necessary. And we see that we do it in a gentle, gradual change, not abrupt changes. And this is the adaptive management. And uh, every 10 years, we need to have a revision. And the uh, the, it is prescribed. We are using uh, the criteria and the guidelines of the MAB system. In fact, it is like rewriting a management plan, but having a management plan. So you check, is this, does it work? Yeah, it does. I keep it there is something that I can improve in this area? Yes, I can. But in fact, I have in front of me all the guidelines and I get step by step on each one of them, ticking boxes or changing things. So in this way, I make sure that any progress is reflected. I have perhaps even more ambition so I may have, uh, let's say, more ambitious tasks. And here I come to answer a very important question about uh, by uh, Manal Fauzi, uh, who asked, what are the most fitting management tracking tools to evaluate the effectiveness of a biosphere reserve? And management process. A difficult uh, question uh, requiring a thorough answer. In fact, it is not only the effectiveness that we are um, asking here, effectiveness, but in all management plans, we need to check all the so-called five DAC OECD criteria. So we need to see if it is still relevant, our management plan, effective, yes, efficiently delivered, and at the same time, if it has impact, the impact we wanted, and it is sustainable. So it has to, to be there also, the biosphere reserve and the management in the coming decades and more. To do that, I go back to the decentralized I made before and the management plan itself. When we have the management plan, we decide also on targets. We say, for example, for the protection, I need to bring back or to keep uh, one pair of eagles I have or uh, I need to bring back a few species that uh, have disappeared in the last few years. This is, uh, this is uh, 
part of my vision. Or I need, so I check if I manage to do that. Uh, I, I may go to something that is more in my hands. For example, in a water scarce area like in Asterusia, uh, we have as part of our plan to enhance the water resources of the region. Uh, and we said at the beginning, we need to have five, six of these uh, water sources revitalized. And to make it target, we say in the first three years, or in two years, or in one year, or in five years. These are linked with indicators. And these are indicators of efficiency, effectiveness, impact, all what I mentioned before. This is how we track the progress. And we have these indicators, ideally, should be also agreed with the local communities. So I have presented to you the Sudesir example that we had in Rhodes, where the scientists that prepare the plan come with a number of criteria and indicators. And the local community responds to that. And some of these indicators, they find it not ambitious enough or too ambitious. And then you need to have some kind of negotiation. This is the way in which we track progress. And I can tell you that you cannot have success in all your targets. And you have to judge uh, where are you going. And this may lead to the revision of the management plan in some of these areas by the adaptive management I mentioned before. So I uh, replied also to this um, uh, set of, uh, of, uh, of questions. And finally, uh, there are, um, if I left something out, I apologize. Um, there is uh, um, also um, how we can encourage uh, BR managers uh, to actually uh, adopt uh, the adaptive management. This is a question by Mohammed Hosni from Egypt. My answer is very simple. By showing examples, by showing good practices and uh, biosphere reserves and the network we have offers this opportunity because in, in a way, um, we all, we are all eager to learn more. It is something that there is no fixed rule for everything. And uh, we are learners all the time. So we have to approach it always with an innovative, humble, and uh, uh, way and uh, uh, all inclusive. So uh, this is my contribution in replying to your questions, but I'm here to answer. One, if, one uh, clarification, uh, if you can make, because we have a question in the chat, uh, can we use the same tools for uh, protected areas or management effectiveness uh, tools or the IUCN green list? Um, yes, in principle, yes, because first of all, all protected areas today, uh, most of them, both uh, the Natura 2000 sites, but also uh, Ramsar sites and other uh, sites under UNEP, uh, at, at least in the Mediterranean, I know, especially protected areas, have more or less adopted the same um, approach. They have, allow me to say, followed or copied uh, the biosphere reserve philosophy. They don't want these areas to be entirely and only for the protection, but are also as uh, somehow contributors to sustainable development. So um, it is not exactly the same uh, because the targets um, there are 90% uh, 
conservation and protection uh, of uh, biodiversity, species, uh, and other things. However, there is always room also for sustainable development. So it might be the percentage, let's say, of the criteria are a little bit more shifted towards conservation than sustainable development. So the targets are different. And uh, the, but you need uh, also to create a vision there that is not only, is not restricted only to conservation in order to gain the support of the society around the protected areas. It is a good, a, a good uh, let's say, idea to learn from the uh, biosphere reserves and uh, expand this even without having formal buffer and formal uh, transition zones. You may consider the zone around with the help of the inhabitants into this kind of uh, you know, a transition area where sustainable development has to be demonstrated. I don't know if there is any other question, but you come back to me, of course, uh, after uh, hearing the other uh, colleagues. Thank you very much, Professor Skoulos, for all these explanations and cl clarifications. And now we give the floor to Dr. Vasiliki Vlami, uh, who will provide us with clarifications on cultural landscapes and the cultural services that the ecosystems provides us, how we can combine um, the, the protection of these sacred, let's say, natural, natural and unique sites with the sustainable development. So, Dr. Vlami, uh, the floor is yours. Can you please unmute, unmute yourself? Your mic. Um. We don't hear. Also, please unmute. Unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'll start with the first question from uh, Maria Yanakaki. It says, how can we reconcile our need for renewable energy with the need to protect and preserve landscapes? And this was, is a very nice question and um, a very popular, I think. So despite uh, the benefits and the, the need for renewable energy, the siting and operation of uh, some forms, such as wind farms, mainly in sensitive ecological and cultural areas, continues to be a source of concern for many conservationists. This is a problem that exists everywhere. Now, some people may think that resentment against some um, renewable, renewable energy sources, such as wind farms, is only egotistical. It comes from the not in my backyard concept. But it is now generally agreed that most wind farm conflicts are not adequately explained by the not in my backyard concept. It's something greater than this. It has to do with the sense of place, with landscape authenticity, with aesthetic attractiveness, with biodiversity integrity and more. Now the extent and severity of the impact of wind farms on the biodiversity and integrity of protected areas greatly depends on the proper wind farm siting. And it's all about siting. 
period. As anything in planning, we, have, we can have the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's all about this question. So I'm going to the second question from Anastasia Mirli. Uh, no, sorry, it's um, the second question is, um, I don't have the name now of the person. What role can circuit, it was anonymous, what role can circuit natural sites play in biodiversity conservation in biosphere, in biosphere reserves? Now, sacred natural sites are almost certainly the world's oldest form of habitat protection. So um, they can increase a conservation value of the protected areas. So they should be included within uh, the protected areas. So there's a tradition in many religions of protecting sacred species or sacred sites, cultural uh, or landscapes uh, close to religious uh, places, to religious buildings. Research shows that such, such sites have a high conservation values and better protection than legally protected areas. Therefore, without added measures, we can get effective conservation by including circuit natural sites. Additionally, conservation institutions are recognizing the role of uh, religion and spiritual values uh, in conservation. So they all have initiatives linking conservation with religion. Another question from Anastasia Mirli is, uh, yes, is, um, which are the indicators for assessing cultural ecosystem services? How can lab be used? Using a questionnaire to the stakeholders is correct method. All three of these points, of your points, Anastasia, um, are justifiable. The CES, the lab, and the questionnaire can be used in planning and protected, in protected areas management. Now, about the indicators. These may vary based on the information available and the aims of the assessment. A broad scale country wide CES assessment may use simple and straightforward indicators. But if we are looking at a specific protected area, a very large number of indicators may be used for mapping and assessing CES at a finer scale. So broad scale, we have two scales, the broad scale we have the proxy indicators, which, provi which provide indirect measures that approximate or may represent a phenomenon in the absence of a direct measure. And they are now widely used in social sciences and interdisciplinary, in interdisciplinary research. Here, we can ignore I mean, in the broad scale, the new instances. Now, when we have a specific protected area, we can use geographical, cultural, recreational, and historical knowledge to be specific. In this way, in a fine scale approach, we can map all the details in order to assess and communicate various values, aesthetic values recreational values, sense of place, religious values. For example, traditional uh, values in the sense of a um, local fiesta in a specific location. So here 
in the specific protected area, the nuances, the details are very important. So I'm going to another question from Lucy Dimitrova. Does the evaluation, she's talking about the landscape of, um, assessment protocol now, requires require any specific experience, background, who is usually the person that does the evaluation? Normally, it requires training. We suggest two days training in cultural and natural history of the area that is going to be assessed. However, this is not mandatory. Many of the stressed states of the landscapes that are related to the metrics of the lab is common sense. And the narrative guidelines help anyone to attempt the assessment. There is some subjectivity, of course, but with experience and increasing landscape literacy, we can all be able to assessing landscapes. Now, another question is, how well are specific objectives and activities considering cultural landscapes implemented in BR and other designated area management plans? There are many important human activities that may maintain cultural landscapes. We have traditional grazing in small free, range, small free ranging, traditional agriculture, again, small scale, fire to maintain grazing, um, forestry practices, wood cutting in small uh, scale. Other important elements of the cultural landscape may include stone walls, traditional architecture, pathways and eroded areas, areas that cannot um, dry, but it's just for working. Management plans in some protected areas, such as in Britain's uh, national parks, have made efforts to preserve these elements and features of cultural landscapes for many decades now. So it is very important to think about promoting these management measures, even in areas which are targeted primarily for biodiversity conservation, such as Natura 2000 network. Another question from Maria Kulik, if I say it correctly, is, is it possible to deliver such an abstract idea of cultural landscape to all stakeholders? So if we focus on the relationship through education and training, perhaps more stakeholders will learn to appreciate cultural landscapes. Another question is, Ms. Vlami, uh, to which extent can a certain landscape, which is protected for its uniqueness, be changed in sense of the sustainable development? Sustainable development means opportunities for future, for next generations. It is hard to measure the extent of change because landscape is very sensitive to incremental changes. Therefore, there is why we need landscape literacy to be able to appreciate what is right and what is wrong. Other question now. In the case of cultural ecosystem services, what step would you propose for integrating these non-material benefits to land management policies? There are different steps that we can take. Until now, CES have been largely ignored or overlooked 
in planning and policy decision making. So some of the steps that we can take are that we need an inventory of all the cultural values that are provided by ecosystems in protected areas. Says assessments on different special scales, state, regional, local. This is required. There are opportunities to connect SES values to specific measures. For example, now, um, walking trails are often poorly maintained. If we maintain them, we can have visitors, environmental education, environmental education, and, th and thus increasing SES values. And then communication strategy is very important. Public awareness to promote protected area conservation initiatives. In that way, we are using SES as a new framework to influence land management policies. And another question from Maria Yanakaki, how can we reconcile our need for a new oh no i have seen oh yes that was all the questions if you have something to ask please ask me thank you thank you very much uh, uh vasiliki uh, i don't see any new any new questions at the moment have, at the chat I I have a question. Yes, Professor Vaso. Actually, yes, first of all, Vaso, you mentioned many times protected areas, and we all understand that you meant at the same time biosphere reserves, because we mm -hmm. said from the beginning that biosphere reserves are not only protected areas. And because of that, uh, there are two. I have one question which um, you said, but I. I it is for asking you to repeat something. All natural ecosystems uh, ha develop, they, they, they evolve. And one of the issues here about the change of uh, landscape, the change of the landscape to a certain extent is um, unavoidable. On the other hand, in many protected areas, we want to keep forever, if possible, a particular state of this development. For example, we don't want to have a, a further expansion of plants in a lake, and we don't want to have a, a sediment in the lake because we are going to, to lose the lake in some time. So here, there is a, 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 a something we need, uh, you need perhaps to explain us, uh, what do we mean by accepting change and actually in other cases as part of the character of, a, of an area, actually inhibiting change. And this is uh, within management, but this uh, perhaps, uh, I have the answer as the management, but perhaps you can also give us something about the, the landscape. Yes. As, as, uh, as briefly uh, as possible, because we have a lot of more yes, speakers yes. and 35 minutes. Okay. Um, because landscape is uh, very sensitive, um, it depends where we are referring about the change, the change of which landscape? There are so many different landscapes. Um, it's a difficult uh, answer to give. Um, we yeah, have it, to, yeah? Actually, uh, what I, uh, I wanted you uh, to explain, perhaps uh, we don't have the time, is that when I have a lake and I want to keep yes. always the lake, I need to intervene with, uh, in, in a positive way, 
actually inhibiting the natural evolution because we I want to keep the lake forever a lake and not actually expand the natural vegetation which little by little will turn the lake into a play into into something into land so there I I make an intervention a technical intervention to keep yeah. to keep the, the the landscape which is different yeah. from what I accept as let's say a forest where I don't intervene and say okay the forest is going to change uh, and you mentioned the, the the fire and other things so yeah these are some we need to explain to to our uh, uh, audience that uh, uh, we are not talking about something static but no. but sometimes we want to have a picture that is static and we want to keep this picture forever so this in the mind of many people is a contradiction this is all what i want to say Yes, and we have uh, an example with uh, Symphalia Lake uh, with that the vegetation has expanded so much that uh, there is no lake now there. And uh, what should we do? Um, some of the measures was to cut uh, the vegetation. But again, um, the natural environment has been degraded very much. Um, landscapes evolve, but we have to keep that in mind, and they evolve as our societies evolve. evolve. But uh, when I was talking about um, those uh, traditional uh, agriculture and traditional grazing and um, fires, the, those are to the, those those activities. Let's say activities are to keep um, the landscape are to keep the, the cultural the cultural uh, the culturalness of the the cultural value of the landscape not everywhere but in some uh, specific places such as in uh, protected areas um, um, yeah Thank you, Vasiliki, for the clarification. Thank you, Thank you very big, much. Uh, it's a big uh, discussion and it's a matter of scale, uh, as uh, both of you um, stressed, and the uh, time, the time factor is very crucial. Uh, I would like to come to Mr. Campbell now. He's, um, ah, I see you calling. Uh, we have the, some questions for you. So uh, Mr. Campbell um, explained to us this week uh, the use of the assist social capital approach. So why is this approach important for a biosphere reserve? Uh, is there a way to enhance it in a biosphere reserve? And uh, what is the difference in applying it in a site that is not a, a beer uh, biosphere reserve? And uh, one more question, if there are suitable tools or instruments for measuring uh, the social capital at a community level. If you can try to keep it. Short. Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity to join you today. Um, interesting to see how many people there are from so many different countries. Um, I've uh, written some answers here just to keep it brief and succinct. So. Um, in response to the first question, why is social capital important for a biosphere reserve? It's important because it's the operating platform for any collaboration involving human beings. The makeup of relationships in any context is directly correlated to the outcomes produced. So social capital is related to the field of complexity science, which sees the world as an interconnected network with feedback loops. Biosphere reserves are dealing with complex systems and problems that are dynamic, unpredictable and multidimensional, consisting of a collection of interconnected relationships. This means that we cannot control the desired outcomes of a biosphere reserve through a top down centralized management approach. Rather, we need to adopt distributed approaches of connected action with shared purpose. Biosphere reserves are, means to, are meant to be living laboratories 
and they are closely related to ecosystem management in that case. And social capital is a tool that helps manage complex systems. So therefore, it seems um, correct to use something like that um, and adopt this methodology to help with a process which responds to the human centric approach of a biosphere reserve. How do you enhance a biosphere reserve with social capital? So what makes a biosphere reserve unique is their size and the inclusion of people in the space, particularly in the transition zone. Without people, there's no need for a biosphere reserve. So, and as outlined above, um, what I said before, biosphere reserves are by their nature complex dynamic systems that are unpredictable and multidimensional because there are so many people and so many interests. Similar to how science measures ecosystems, we need a methodology to enhance biosphere reserves that can deal with the inherent complexity and multi-dimensional multi aspects of working with large diverse populations of people. Social capital as defined by the OECD and the World Bank enables collaboration on shared objectives within communities that have defined boundaries. This can be a biosphere reserve or a geopark or another protected area, even a company or a school. We need to be sensitive to the fact that our objectives may not be the same as everyone else in the area, but we can find shared understanding. Imagine telling a footballer to care about the microbes in the soil because the microbes themselves are important to science. What will the outcome be, do you think? Instead, tell him or her that the microbes are critical to the health of the football pitch and therefore to the quality of football they play and they will look after the microbes for you without you having to do anything. The footballer in this case is not a member of the biosphere committee, could have no knowledge of the uh, biosphere reserve or even the management document, but can be seen as an effective peer and ally in the process of supporting biodiversity. If the complex diverse nature of our collective economic interests are respected and enabled. A great example of using local people culture and economic interest in helping manage a biosphere reserve is Apanino Tosco Miliano and Filippo is here today with us and he can say more and um, where they've worked with many local businesses and cooperatives and in fact there's an article on that and the reference material I gave on geod and the special edition on biosphere reserves and finally what is the difference for a non-biosphere reserve site there's no difference decentralized communities are more agile innovative and resilient no matter where they are or what their purpose is the only issue we need to be clear about is the boundary of whatever site or organization we're interested in and the purpose. The replicability of social capital as an operating platform for collaboration is the very reason it makes sense to use it in a biosphere reserve or any other form of collaboration, especially in large complex situations. Thank you. Okay, Sorry, yeah, the much. final question, the final question which uh, you gave me was, yes, there are tools. Um, in fact, we have developed a, a large scale tool um, to measure social capital and then manage social capital. And um, we've worked with over 100 not for profit organisations. We're currently working with uh, the Scottish government to help them optimise social capital within their management system. We're also working with Ashoka, which is the world's largest social entrepreneurs network, and continuing to work with more organizations in the impact investment space who are interested in using uh, this platform, which we called Unlocking Potential, to help them demonstrate and measure SDGs in the work that they are doing. Um, and be happy to um, talk to anybody who's interested in finding out more about our platform. Thank you, Colin. Thank you very much for your clarifications. And we move on with uh, Mr. Baker, Jonathan Baker from the UNESCO Regional Office in Venice. Jonathan, are you still with us? All right. Um, yes, I'm here. I'm happy to come in on whatever points uh, you, you need me to come in on. Okay. Actually, these questions, uh, we're addressing uh, Maryam Bumran, as you well known, that she had the unit uh, on the uh, communication strategy of the MAB uh, after 2018. Nevertheless, if you can help us uh, clarifying some uh, points. Uh, one question is that um, 
map concept is not well understood by many people still in most BRs. Are we doing enough to raise awareness and to educate people about their importance, the importance of BRs? Another uh, question uh, is that uh, if a site has uh, multi designations, UNESCO multi designation, should it draw a single plan for its recognition or should be more appropriate to draw up an integ integrated uh, plan, management plan? Um, another thing is about uh, the synergies. Are there any synergies between uh, cultural? landscapes within BRs and cultural landscapes designated under the World Heritage Convention, if you can help us with this. And uh, there is, no, there is nothing more. All right, uh, sounds good. I'm happy to, to respond to all three. I think Michael touched upon the second one in his, uh, in his intervention, but um, uh, with regard to the um, uh, the communication aspects about biosphere reserves and MAB. Uh, I think uh, uh, we at the Secretariat fully agree that there's still quite a bit of work that needs to be done, uh, both by ourselves at the global level and by biosphere at, uh, and, and at the national level by MAB committees and also by uh, individual biosphere reserves to better communicate and, and uh, with uh, the stakeholders on the ground and at all different levels. I mean, I think a lot of work has been done to try to improve the way that we communicate about MAB and about um, uh, biosphere reserves, you know, through going through a, a bottom-up process of developing a MAB communication strategy of uh, developing different tools that can help biosphere reserve uh, uh, speak and communicate better about, um, about their sites and about the nature of what a biosphere reserve is. Uh, but obviously, if you look at, you know, there's some surveys that have been done um, uh, or regarding how many, you know, the, the, the people within biosphere reserves and whether they know that they live in a biosphere reserve, or whether they know what a biosphere reserve is uh, and, and, and how important um, biosphere reserves can be for them, it, the, the numbers are still very, very low. So there's really a lot of work that needs to be done uh, in that respect. Uh, but I would say that we're at the, at the level of the MAP secretary very aware of this. And this is why we've been going through this process of putting together a MAP, um, a MAP communication strategy of working with the, the biosphere reserves to develop tools to assist them at the, at the local level. But yes, it's still, there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done uh, and uh, quite a lot of work that we're doing right now, um, working you know, in Italy uh, uh, for this regional bureau and also at the broader scale of Southeast Europe and the Mediterranean, also for this regional bureau and the, and the, the MAP secretariat is working at it uh, at the global level. But yes, uh, I, think the, um, I think we've done, uh, we've progressed quite a bit in the past five years but there's still quite a ways to go. Um, so that uh, hopefully answers uh, your first question. Um, let's see, uh, with regard to uh, the uh, cultural landscapes uh, issue, I think that, I think we've kind of covered that quite a, quite a bit in, uh, in, in um, uh, one of the previous interventions, but I mean, cultural landscapes is a, is a, is a concept that, uh, uh, you know, was first recognized through the the World Heritage uh, Convention at the at the national level. They, they recognized it in 1992 um, as kind of the first uh, international legal instrument to to recognize and protect cultural landscapes, which they define as combined works of nature and man. So for the, the World Heritage Center and the, the World Heritage Committee, cultural landscapes are really an integral part of of these sites, um, and there are many sites now that are. Uh, uh, that are nominated and selected because of this specifically. Um, uh, for biosphere reserves, obviously the same concepts apply. There's not so much uh, reference to that, uh, let's see, at the, uh, not as much as at the global level within the, the, the documents. But if you look, there's a lot of work that's been done in specific biosphere reserves related to that research and papers that are, uh, so I think the, the concepts are the same. Uh, it's, uh, let's say it's a little bit less present in the biosphere reserve discussion as it in uh, at the world, at the level of the World Heritage. Uh, committee. Um, and see, what was the third question? The third question was related to uh, management. Sorry, just tell me again. I think this one was covered by Michael, but I'm happy to compliment. I think uh, you have covered all of them. Okay. And I'm happy to come in later on, on other on other issues because they're very, very important, interesting topics, uh, you know, such as one I feel covered by Filippo on branding and all that, which is a, a complicated, a complex issue. Um, and uh, so I'm happy to come in on that and, and 
afterwards. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. And by the way, the one of the options for the assignment, actually two of the uh, options of the assignment are uh, linked to the um, a communication strategy presented uh, by Miriam in the e-course. E so our learners have uh, the possibility to choose from four scenarios and two of them are linked with the communication uh, strategy. So they can um, either um, create a proud to share video for the purposes of uh, this course or um, uh, do a um, simulation of an um, engagement plan um, due to COVID probably with their colleagues instead of the actual target group that they meant to engage. But this is a practice that uh, uh, we think that um, uh, combines very well with the communication strategy of um, uh, the MAP program. So I would like to welcome also Filippo in this conversation. Uh, <laughs> it's nice to see you again. And um, we have two specific questions for you regarding uh, your presentations in the e-course. So um, one of them is um, if you can give us uh, some advice how to overcome the label risk in Asterusia specifically, uh, because uh, how do we combine the BR label with existing strong labels like the label made in Crete, which is very uh, strong there. Another question, um, what happens in case an entity considers itself sustainable and uses the BR brand in its products, but without the agreement of the staff of the BR. Um, thank you very much, Hero. Uh, first of all, sorry for my late. Uh, I, I would like to ask you to um, repeat the second question because I lost the first part of the, of the voice. Uh, so one question was uh, how to overcome the label yes. risk. And yes. the second one the second is what one. happens if a private entity considers it itself uh, sustainable and uses the BR brand without the agreement of the BR uh, staff. Okay, thank you very much. I understood. Okay, I will start with uh, the second question. I think that the question is uh, referring uh, to one of the practical example that I, I, I brought in my, in my speech and um, exactly the one in Delta Po. In Delta Po, the brand of the Biosphere Reserve is given uh, to enterprise uh, or association too that are involved in a, uh, in a path through uh, the sustainability. So the idea is that the brand is not for those that are already uh, at a high level of uh, environment, uh, social uh, um, responsibility, but they are wishing to grow up their situation, to improve. What happens if the brand is used by someone who has not uh, signed this uh, pacto with the Biosphere Reserve? We don't have a a specific uh, law that uh, say you have to pay a fee or, or something like that. But of course, uh, who want to use the brand usually do it for reputation and communication for marketing. So the idea is that if someone is using the brand not in a correct way, the best fair serve will communicate through the local media or national media that this company is uh, uh, acting in an unfair way. And this is a very st strong impact because if they are, wanted to use the brand for marketing, this is a, a very negative marketing for them. So at the moment, we don't have any case, uh, to, in, at least uh, in the best fair server that I uh, described in the, in the speech of uh, unfair use of the brand. Uh, instead of to avoid the, the label risk, uh, I don't think that the label risk uh, is uh, strictly connected to the presence of other label in a territory. What I mean with uh, label risk? I, I mean that uh, the idea of biosphere reserve uh, is uh, 
strictly connected to the possibility of the use of the of the brand of the biosphere reserve. This is the, the, the labor risk. I think that the biosphere reserve should aim to use the brand to improve the mission, the specific mission of the biosphere reserve. So even enterprise or organization that should, uh, uh, sorry, that want to have the brand should uh, uh, follow this mission and demonstrate in fact that they are part of the project. So the labor risk uh, is, um, is, very, um, is very possible. It's possible when uh, in a territory, the idea of the, 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 of the, um, of the biosphere reserve is just, uh, 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 it's just a, a name, it's just a, a way to, to, to have more visibility. Anyway, if in a territory are already existing uh, important uh, label or certification that prove that, uh, that an enterprise is uh, acting in an environmental or social uh, responsibility, I think that the best uh, solution is the one that adopted, for example, uh, in Italy, the Alpe Ledrense Judicaria, but I know that even in Spain, a lot of biosphere server use this kind of umbrella brand. That means that if you are uh, already having an, a label, an eco label, you can also have uh, the brand of the biosphere server. I think that this could be a way especially for this territory in which there are already a lot of uh, ecological and social label existing and well spread. We have, we have one more question, but please try to keep it short because I want to save some time for our young experts. Uh, what are the characteristics of a product to be qualified uh, for branding? I think that the main characteristic is to be close to the mission of the biosphere reserve. If the mission is mainly environmental respect, of course, the, 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 the problem should have an environmental high level. But if the mission is more close to the capacity to keep uh, people living in a determinated area, maybe uh, it's just... Uh, um, uh, a social value should be enough to give them the brand. Okay, it's nice that we still have some time for our young experts to share our uh, experiences based on the questions from the audience. So we can start uh, with uh, Chokri. Um, Chokri has presented a case study in our e-course about uh, responsible snor snorkeling and other means as a way to engage and sensitize the visitors of the protected area of Melula Bay. So the question for you uh, is, can you explain what kind of institutional framework is needed? Could you overcome these barriers by networking with similar, pro similar projects around? Chokri, can you hear us? If not, we can move on with Katrin, Katrin's case study. Hi, Katrin. Hello. So the question for you is the following. How did the school students test their first ideas about the making dolls and cosmetics before the switch to, chocolate, to the chocolate idea? And how do they connect the brand to the BR? Yes, thank you, Vicky. So as I mentioned in our, my presentation, the girls were part of a, a junior achievement competition and they have been part of the team for quite some time. So one of the years they tried to, to participate with the idea of the handmade dolls and uh, cosmetics. And although this was nothing new and there were already uh, similar products existing on the market, uh, they needed to present something. So this was uh, their best idea. Unfortunately, this was not so well accepted by the jury because it was nothing innovative and they needed to continue looking for more local ideas, more innovative ideas. And this is how 
um, eventually they ended up with uh, the current idea that they're developing with the chocolates that are made with handmade hand made uh, rose jam, but it's also vegan and um, sugar free. And uh, with regards to the second question about um, the the BR and the connection. Unfortunately, the, the, their product is very new and uh, it's not yet connected to the BR. And this is actually one of my um, jobs right now would be to inform them more about the BR, about the opportunities that uh, UNESCO could be giving to them as uh, promotion and, and marketing and to work together with them in order to incorporate this in their strategy. Thank you, Katrin. Thank you very much. And we'll move on with Jimena. Jimena. Hi. Yes. Hi. Hi. Again. <laughs> well, we would <laughs> like to <laughs> So uh, the question to you is this. Uh, can the market ready model that you presented in your case study be tried vice versa? in order to change the practices of over touristic sites to a more sustainable ones yeah um the the one of the points of the model is actually not to bring or attract more tourists but attract better tourists so um increase well first connecting the tourism offer to specialized uh, market niches and also uh, because when you transform a service of a, or an activity into an experience, the perceived value of the market and the tourists increases by like 500% or something like that. So that on one side reduces the effort and the work and the investment from the local communities or the, the people offering tourism. And on the other hand, you bring people who are basically willing to pay more. Um, but it also, this experience design process also works for di diversifying the offer in the Biosphere Reserve. And so this charging like high pressure on certain points, like the most popular points, um, the, the, the areas with over tourism, you can diversify the offer and hence discharge this, the pressure on these areas. That was super brief, but I hope that answered the question. We appreciate that. Okay. Well, this is a very interesting model presented by Jimena. So I encourage everyone to follow um, all the video lectures. We have a few more minutes, maybe for some general I, I, remarks. I think I think that Jonathan wanted to make yes a, a for a round product. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I didn't. I, I didn't want to come in. Um, um, I, I just wanted to again highlight what I highlighted uh, la last week uh, with regard to um, a bunch of different things. But uh, in relation to also uh, the use of the UNESCO logo and the MAB logo, um, that there are uh, these, uh, you know, the guidelines that just came out um, uh, this past. Uh, they were just uh, reviewed by the. Um, by the council this past session, um, and with an interesting um, uh, part on the on the Mab logo. So you may want to also take a look at that because it's it hasn't it's true that it hasn't been very clear uh, how to use the Mab logo and how to combine it with the UNESCO logo and how to combine the Biosphere Reserve logo with the UNESCO logo as well. And so there's a little bit more clarity on that, which is good. And and so I'd encourage you to go take a look at the technical guidelines for biosphere reserves. Um, and basically the indications there, I mean, this is more, the, the most important part I think of, of Filippo's presentations is, the, is uh, and which I completely agree with is, you know, the importance of using the MAB brand and, and how use the MAB brand and what for, uh, but you do have to be a little bit careful uh, when you're uh, using both uh, the UNESCO part of the brand and, and, and MAB. Um, so anyways, I'll t just, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that, but if you want to take a look at the technical guidelines that were just reviewed by the uh, MAB council, I would encourage you to do that. That's the, I'll leave it at that, but thank you all very much for a very interesting presentations and great uh, uh, interaction with the students. Uh, just a clarification, the technical guidelines that Jonathan just uh, mentioned uh, can be found in a link uh, underneath his video. 
So you go to Shishido and you will see the link uh, connect, connecting to the technical guidelines so that you can read more about this uh, fresh um, the news. I don't know if you, anyone wants to make some general uh, remarks. We didn't hear from Vasilis for several uh, learners and we just have one or two more minutes. Professor Spoulos. May I speak? Yes. Uh, I would like uh, to, to present that I don't uh, use uh, the terms of uh, measuring uh, tools. I prefer recording, interpretation and adaptation to current social representation. Also, we use a multi-level analysis for the social capital, both of key forms of uh, community level as well in individual level. We don't use to split uh, the analysis. And uh, we have a very good uh, experience from uh, the Asterusia uh, region. And uh, I would like uh, uh, Professor Skoulos and uh, Ms. Vrenzu to present uh, how we work uh, using uh, the IU. Yeah. It is uh, very important uh, to have in our minds the integrative methodological framework when uh, we are trying to look deeper in the social capital and uh, the vision uh, of the habitats. That's it. Professor Skoulos or Ms. Brenzu for the last remark. Perhaps, uh, perhaps Tano, you want to say something or? Ne, akugo me chere Michele. Ne, ne. Akugo me. Ne, ne. Ne. Dio kuvedis mano sa isela na po ego. Katarhin ni chero me po vresko me mazi sa simera. Ε, αυτό το οποίο θέλω να, έτσι να πω σε όλους είναι, ε, θα μιλήσω ελληνικά γιατί τα αγγλικά μου δεν είναι πολύ καλά. Θα πρέπει να σε μεταφράσω εγώ μόλις τελειώσεις. Ωραία. Άρα λοιπόν, εγώ αυτό το οποίο θέλω να πω είναι ε, το όραμα, πώς εμείς ε, πώς ξεκινήσαμε και πώς είδαμε όλη αυτή την περιοχή, πώς... Ε, σκεφτήκαμε να αξιοποιήσουμε αυτό το τεράστιο αξιακό κεφάλαιο το οποίο έχει αυτή η περιοχή των αστερουσίων σεβόμενη απόλυτα τους ανθρώπους, το περιβάλλον, την ιστορία της περιοχής τα μνημεία τα οποία διαθέτει η συγκεκριμένη περιοχή ε, Ούτω ώστε μέσα από μία αηφόρο ανάπτυξη ε, η οποία σχετίζεται άμεσα με την ένταξη των αστερουσίων στην UNESCO αυτό ήταν όλο το σκεπτικό να δώσουμε σε αυτούς τους ανθρώπους ε, την, ε, την δυνατότητα να αξιοποιήσουν τα χαρακτηριστικά της περιοχής τους ε, προ όφελο των ιδίων σε επόμενη απόλυτα το περιβάλλον. Ευχαριστώ, Θεάνο. Ε, Mrs. Vrenzu, uh, I apologize for uh, using Greek because her uh, English is not very good, but is good enough to understand all the discussion. <laughs> so she mentioned uh, uh, something that is uh, uh, complementary to what uh, Vasilis Psalidas uh, said before. Um, in fact, uh, the way in which we have approached the building of the vision in Asterusia was actually by taking all the existing elements of the area, starting from the landscape, the history, the products, all what uh, are assets for the area, reminding the local people about these assets and make them uh, proud for, first of all, 
for all these assets, but also explaining to them how these assets without being sacrificed could generate for them uh, a better living, could uh, actually bring some uh, compatible development, sustainable development in the area, but from the beginning, making very clear that we are going to base our capital to what exists in the area, what existed in the area, including history and cultural uh, traditions and everything. So um, it took us some time to um, work with the people, with uh, the entire uh, with entire villages, but also with the different sectors, with uh, farmers, with uh, shepherds, with different people, and also different services uh, that are responsible for this area. So um, this is what is described in the integrated methodological framework that I presented to you. And uh, I encourage you to, uh, to use it, read it, uh, because uh, in uh, the framework of this uh, uh, webinar, it was impossible to get into details, but all the details are there. So uh, I added uh, to what uh, both the previous interventions made. And I, I also, also I would like to join uh, uh, Jonathan in thanking you, thanking all of you uh, for uh, the interactive sessions and uh, for your interest. It is evident that many of you enjoy that. Thank you. And I would like to thank uh, all the lecturers and the learners uh, for. Um, the time invested in this Thursday, second Thursday afternoon, one and a half hour from your time. We greatly appreciate your sharing your um, afternoon with us. Uh, we hope that there, there, was, there were some uh, useful clarifications by the experts themselves on the concepts that uh, were um, developed through the lectures. Uh, you can, uh, of course, keep uh, viewing the videos, asking and commenting. And if you have uh, any um, takeaway from your notes from uh, this meeting, please write them in the chat box. In the meantime, we are uh, five minutes late, but I will ask uh, everyone again to switch on the cameras if you want, because it's nice to see your faces, many are familiar faces. Mm -hmm so that we can take a group photo all together until next week. Hi, Suzanne. Jimena, thank you for uh, joining from Mexico. Uh, thank yeah. you for, from Bulgaria, hi. 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 Eftigia. Thanks, everyone, and see you next week. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> Have a nice night. Calispera, Calispera, Calimera here. <laughs> Calimera there. <laughs>